at the door, I'm the shy, retiring, quiet person named Mickey Minner. We have been gifted with monies to do our job. And we consider on the board of Polio Epic, our job is to do outreach and to help polio survivors. One of the ways we do that is to gather information. And we look for reputable medical sources. And I was blown away last fall by a wonderful doctor who's also a polio survivor. And I went to Denver, Colorado to hear her speak to physical therapists. And I was totally amazed. This woman is bright. She's witty. OK, she has a little dry wit, too, which I like. <laughs> But Dr. Uelberg has helped and worked with the Colorado Connections Post Polio Support Group. So she knows that we're struggling. And her biggest struggle is finding doctors who will work with us. And she knows it because she's a polio survivor too. And she's going to help us translate normal people to medical people. Right? Sort of, OK. But with no further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Marty Uhlberg. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to keep this fairly uh, informal, so as I'm going along, if there are questions, uh, indicate somehow. And I'll try to answer them at the time, rather than, at least for me, if I have to wait till the end, I sometimes forget what I was going to ask. So, what's the difference between God and a doctor? God knows he's not a doctor. <laughs> And at least, you know, growing up um, in the 50s, um, it was your relationship with the doctor was yes, sir, no, sir, how high, sir. Um, and it actually has been fairly schizophrenic for me to think that I'm, that I'm actually a doctor. Um, and particularly that. Heaven forbid I'd ever be a surgeon, which regularly I'm not. But I would. I am a retired family doctor, and I did practice in a small town in South Dakota for three years. And I did do some surgery, including C-sections. But it always, if people took a picture of me in the whole garb and at the operating table, I'd say, no, no, that's not me. How many of you remember one or more of your polio doctors? Childhood polio doctors. <coughs> All right, good. What do you remember about them? How they, ha <clears throat> how they handled us. How they handled us. And in terms of? Well, just simply in seeing, you know, motion range, range ability, they'd grab a leg. I mean, I loved my doctor, but when he touched me, it hurt. So he loved his doctor, but when, it touched, when he touched him, it hurt. Oh, I was at Nineton, and I was at the Crown South in St. Louis, and I had a crush on my doctor. Um, crush, on, crush on the doctor. See, now I remember the doctor telling me that it was impossible. I was too young, and I didn't have any atrophy, so therefore I was crazy. Okay, sure that you were crazy. None of that, none of that ever happens now, right? Oh, no. yeah. <laughs> I, I remember them uh, working very well with me. Okay. I remember working very well with me. Good. I was 14 and in a girl's ward, and I remember the orthopedic doctors and a young intern, you know, I would be laying in bed, and they would just come in and just kind of pull back the quilts and the dark hair. Yeah, the end of any modesty. Yeah. <laughs> so that is one thing I do remember. Yes. Okay. I remember um, my doctor was at Warm Springs, Georgia, and we tried to get 
particular position uh, because of the mobility of our society and people moving, changes in insurance, particularly if your insurance is provided by your employer who then tries to find the most economical plan and maybe a whole different network. And this can result in less personalized care. There are very few healthcare providers who know much or even anything about polio. And these days, the bottom line, financial bottom line, may seem more important to healthcare providers uh, and healthcare systems than it did in the past. Some of the things to be prepared for, to understand when you're seeing a healthcare provider today, especially when seeing somebody for the first time, one, it's really useful to be aware of how much time has been scheduled for the appointment. That doesn't mean it's your responsibility to, to keep the provider on schedule, but that lets you know, have some idea about how concise you ought to be when you're presenting your problem, and also how many problems that, you might, that might be addressed during that particular appointment. If you know that it's a 15 minute appointment, going in with a list of 10 things to be looked at is not going to work. And in fact, some physicians now will say, pick one thing. Also, if you're seeing a physician for a Medicare wellness visit, the rules about what the provider can bill for and their time is pretty well laid out by Medicare and it's pretty much looking at have you had the health care, the screenings, you know, have you had your blood pressure checked, um, have you, if you're due the age, have you had a colonoscopy, have you had a mammogram, are you up to date on immunizations, those kind of things. They are not and in fact, Medicare sort of dings the doctor if they, if at the same time you say, oh, I, can you look at my big toe if I step it? I just had one of those exams and because I already have a relationship with a good physician, woman, by the way, who doesn't think she's God or goddess. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it just occurred to me, is it possible that that standard Medicare screening form is available online? Because that would be something, she handed it to me, we talked, I was able to do all of that at the same time, but multitasking is one of my challenges. If uh, people are supposed to have this annually, can we get the form? Good question. Um, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't done family medicine now for a couple of years, and what, even before that I was just supervising residents when they were doing it. But um, it ought to be. Um, the other would be, you know, since you have a relationship with your physician, ask in advance if they could send it to you, or either online or in the mail or whatever, to fill out in advance. It's useful to know, especially the physician you're seeing, and because that affects whether polio or post polio may or may not have any impact on, on that. Um, the orthopedist might be interest, very interested and need to know exactly what orthopedic surgeries you've had done to correct problems related to polio. The ophthalmologist, not so much. <laughs> um, and even the cardiologist, um, rather than you writing them all down and maybe not even knowing what a lot of them were, um, just probably needs to know I've had X number, five orthopedic surgeries on my legs to correct problems related to polio. Um, that helps them understand in terms of like what kind of exercise you do for your heart, but they don't need to know the details. Again, sort of a Medicare requirement, there's this thing called meaningful use of the electronic medical record, that physicians got reimbursed a portion of their cost for implementing a computer system, an electronic medical record. 
but then Medicare puts some rules on what has to be for you to qualify for that. And all the doctors, whether it really is helpful to them or not, and, and healthcare providers like physical therapists, also will need a list of all your medications and supplements. They'll need to know the dosage, the time, how many times a day you take it, and maybe for what condition, because sometimes medicines are used for two or three different things. Um, it's real, and I know it's hard, and it seems like a foreign language sometimes. My mother and my sister just slaughter the names of medicines. Um, but saying it's a little white pill I take for my heart just doesn't do it. When I first started practice, they were mostly brand name drugs, and then I knew that the red and white capsule that looked sort of like a bullet was diazide. Now, with all the generics, the same medicine made by different generic companies could be three different colors. There are some that are standardized. Coumadin, um, that people take as an anticoagulant, is, is standardized the color of the tablets, meaning how many milligrams, across all the generics, but there's very few of those. They'll want to know about adverse reactions to medications. And that's allergies and intolerances. And sometimes, um, you know, you may say, I'm allergic to codeine because it makes me throw up. That's not, medically, that's not really an allergy. I mean, that's still important to know, because you aren't going to be happy with me if I pre prescribe something with codeine in it. But it's not going to kill you. Allergies are things that people really have a serious allergic reaction to. And it also is useful for the healthcare provider, particularly the whoever's going to be prescribing for you, to know what kind of reaction you had. If you've thrown up after you took an ampicillin, um, I probably, again, won't give you ampicillin, but that's not a penicillin allergy, so there may be some other penicillin derived products that I can use and it would be appropriate to use for your infection. Where if you really broke out in hives and had trouble breathing, then no, I don't want to give you a Um, A list of your current and significant past medical issues. Um, probably don't need to know that you fainted once when you were 18. Um, but, um, you know, if you had atrial fibrillation, and you had a blood clot, et cetera. And a list of surgeries, but that doesn't need to include minor things. I saw a gentleman a couple weeks ago who was an engineer. Engineers are, are almost as bad as accountants, whatever. You know, very precise, very detailed, numbers matter. Um, he had a list, six page list of, of all of his medical procedures, etc., including like a repair of a laceration to his finger. You know, most of us, once that's healed, you didn't get a serious infection, I don't really care. Or your broken toe. You know, it hurts, it's miserable, but um, there isn't much we can do about it. It's also useful for the office to know, but probably more important for you to know, um, if there are any special needs you have that's going to affect the visit. Um, Joan was talking to me about hotel rooms that are supposedly accessible, but then the toilets you know, are only that high. Um, if you and not medical professionals should, but they don't always understand. If you're unable to stand or get on and on the standard exam table, especially for a GYN exam, maybe for mammograms, maybe even at the dentist, 
or, or an eye exam, you need to inquire about that. What kind of facilities, what kind of uh, measures do they take to help you? Uh, having one nurse try to lift you up onto the exam table if you're most an ordinary size adult or, or more, <laughs> or fluffy, um, isn't going to work. Um, there are there are exam tables that go up and down so they can lower to the height of your wheelchair and you can slide over, but not everybody has those. Um, if they don't, there's no point in you making the appointment. You know, it's a waste, particularly for something that you know that's going to be required. Uh, it's a waste of your time and the provider's time. Think in advance. Oh, do you have a question? There's one, uh, I don't know if people know about it. There's one uh, facility that, for gynecology that has a up and down table. And, it, and that's the only one I use. But, uh, what's the name of that? I remember. OBGYN. All right. They have. Useful in that one. You know, I, hopefully in this day with the ADA, more and more are moving towards that, but not necessarily. It really is um, useful to know. Um, the last statistic I found was last year, and that only 40% of the medical doctors seeing patients in the U.S. had accessibility. And one doctor told me that if you show up at the office and insist on it, they don't, they're not required to give it to you unless you ask in advance when you make the appointment. But you know, there are some things if you're making the appointment, you know, a week in advance, there isn't even if they wanted to, there isn't time to order the special table and then make sure that there's an electrical outlet that'll plug into easily, et cetera. Well, I was just going to make a comment that um, more and more medical facilities are going into commercial developments, and when those commercial developments are built, they're not required to put doors uh, <coughs> and different things like that. So that's yeah, it, it depends on when when the building was built and what the codes were for that particular Well, actually, my entity. the one doctor that I was seeing, which is the U.S. <coughs> hospital, that office doesn't have power doors because it's a commercial development. It wasn't developed as a medical building. It was developed for commercial reasons. <laughs> well, even my eye doctor built her own building, and she has to have Yeah, it's, it's a challenge. And even if it's sometimes a medical building, it gets interesting. The medical building that our office was in was a brand, had been a brand new medical building in maybe 2010. And it was built specifically as a medical building. The elevator would not accommodate a ambulance stretcher laid out flat. Oh. And the cardiologists were all on the third floor. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> or, Tucson story, when the university hospital was first built, they built it with oxygen in the walls. However, the drywallers covered it all up. <laughs> so the emergency room, when the emergency room opened, there were tanks of oxygen sitting around because they couldn't access the wall of oxygen. Oh, <laughs> all right, back to, um, so succinctly, but thoroughly describe your problem or concern. And think about how you can do that. I don't necessarily need exact dates like the engineers and the CPAs provide, but I start rolling my eyes when somebody says, well, it was about the time of Mary's wedding. No, maybe it was Jane's wedding. No, maybe, you know, please. I have no idea when Mary or Jane got married. If you're describing pain, expect that the healthcare provider is going to ask certain questions about the pain. 
And those are, and I'll explain it more, but intensity, severity, location, character, duration, aggravating, relieving factors, and maybe what, including with it, uh, what you've done, what you've tried. So intensity, severity, that's the old zero to 10 scale. And I know that's really difficult to imagine. And, you know, there's all kinds of systems now with different faces, et cetera. Um, but if you tell me your pain's a 15, that decreases your credibility exponentially. You know, on the scale, 10 is supposed to be the worst possible pain you could think of. You know, you broke your thigh bone and the bone sticking out of your skin. Mm -hmm. Kind of kind of pain. Or sometimes people will equate that to childbirth, but some people have fairly easy pregnancies in childbirth. Or a kidney stone, if you cut that. But it, basically, if pain's really at a 10, you should not be able to talk through it. You're going to be gritting your teeth. Then. The location. So where is it? And does it go anywhere? Does it radiate? Um, that can help particularly with some nerve kind of pain. Um, if you know the route, if it's the healthcare provider, you know the route where, where the nerve supplies, then, oh, right down into your big toe tells me which nerve is likely involved. Character. Is it dull and aching? Is it sharp stabbing? Is it burning? Um, all of those things start my computer going. <coughs> Crushing chest pain like an elephant on my chest makes me think, oh my goodness, is this person having a heart attack? Burning chest pain says, yeah, it's probably more GI. It's some, some GERD, some esophageal reflux, heartburn. Um, sharp stabbing, maybe, particularly when you take a deep breath, makes me think, is this pneumonia? Is this a pulmonary embolus? And it, it really leads the provider down different pathways. You start taking this, this route and then asking more questions about that. The duration, how long does it last? You know, if it lasts several hours or all day, it's different than something that lasts for five or 10 seconds. In fact, something that lasts for five or 10 seconds or even less than 30 minutes, probably like any medicines aren't gonna be useful because by the time you took them, it gets absorbed into your system, the pain's gonna be gone anyway. The aggravating or relieving factors. So what makes it worse, what makes it better? And it's even okay of what makes it partially better. It doesn't have to totally take, relieve it. And then what have you tried? And what have the results been? Um, there's some things that are and totally unrelated to pain, but that are interesting, bizarre little medical facts. There's a condition now related to heavy use of marijuana that causes cyclic vomiting. Um, one of the things that tends, not always, but tends to relieve that is getting in a hot shower. If somebody tells me they're having all this vomiting and the only thing that helps is getting in a hot shower, then ding, 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 you know, I'm gonna start asking some questions about marijuana. Be perfect. Be prepared for the healthcare provider to not know anything about polio. Um, you know, that's the, the reality. Um, if they know much about polio, they probably have grown up in a foreign country where polio was still present. Um, or they're really old. The important thing is their willingness to learn. And consider 
when you're, if you're giving them written information, or even other forms, try to do it in small bits. One is, you may have a 15 minute appointment. You can't do a whole dissertation on polio in 15 minutes. Um, don't give them a book. Not many folks are going to take the time to read the whole book. Probably not more than one or two pages at a time. And you can do one or two pages this visit, and one or two pages the next visit. <coughs> Our group, for those of you that know, we came up with that same concept several years ago and developed something called Post Polio 101, and it's a bullet list, two pages. Straight, simple facts and easy to understand. So we have that available for anybody that wants one. Could you send that to your doctor, or would they be the solver? Depends on the doctor. But you know, if people are if people are insulted, then you know maybe you need to think about a different doctor if that's at all possible. But. I think our brochures which I brought about 50 of them back there today or more. And they're very concise, and I've been handing those out. I met my doctor retired, so I've had to go through this whole process. A series of young people that look like maybe they're just getting out of high school. <laughs> so, and they've been, they have been very good about it, and actually have asked me for more information. Sure. So John said there's about 50 copies of their brochure that yeah, out as information. We have a lot more. And there's more. But the next general meeting. Actually, with this PPS 101, we encourage our members to get a copy to every one of the medical personnel. Right. So we need my eye doctor, my heart doctor, all my specialists, everybody, my dentist has a copy of it. But um, I was going to tell you that one time I went to see the self-security doctor in Green Valley, Arizona. And I called ahead of time to ask if he knew anything about post polio syndrome, and his receptionist at Bill assured me that he did. So when I arrived, and I wanted to get some advice about my right foot that had been fused together. So, uh, and I actually took a foot up to ahead of time, which was available to him. And then when I arrived, he said to me, um, I know nothing about polio or post polio syndrome, and it's not in my uh, best interest to learn because you're all dying off anyway. <laughs> I, have, I have one patient that is a polio survivor and I have to be sad. And then he never looked at my foot, so I finally took my shoe off and stuck my foot in his face. <laughs> and he billed my insurance company about $300 for that little kid. Yes, <clears throat> and that's a time to say. Mm -hmm. The physical therapist that used to work with me said, if, particularly if you have involvement in your legs, um, if you're seeing an orthopedic surgeon and they don't ask you to walk, to watch you walk, run out of their office as fast as possible. <laughs> Some of it is, is transferable. Um, 
I also had a time that a resident saw a patient and uh, we'd had a, six weeks out of the hospital and had a stroke and she clearly was pretty involved. Um, and I said to the resident, how did she get here today? I don't know. Well, our, our parking lot at that time was at a fairly decent slant and in the winter time, you know, if you had to park a ways away, it was really dangerous coming across that parking lot. Um, she didn't have a handicap park. Nobody thought to offer a handicap parking environment so she could, or her driver could park closer. Um, so some is just helping with general sensitivity about disabilities. Um, be aware, what's true for you is not necessarily true for everybody else in this room. Polio is unique in how it affected people. Just look around this room. There's some folks who have limited use of their arms. Other people have limited use of the legs. Some people may have both. Some of you may look perfectly fine but have serious problems swallowing. Um, and the healthcare provider, the, the reason I'm mostly saying healthcare provider is to make it general, to include physical therapists, occupational therapists, etc. Um, cannot at first glance or even sometimes later, know intuitively how it affected you. And that includes both physically and emotionally. Um, in the 50s, at least my experience, I don't think I ever had any counseling or anybody um, address um, how, what it would mean to grow up with a disability. It was just get on with things, don't cry over spilled milk. Um, and so, and one of the questions I ask on the history form of new patients I see is if they've ever received any counseling to deal with the polio experience. And probably less than 10% have. Um, and you know, the reality is we all have some psychological <coughs> scars as well as the physical scars from the long hospitalizations with, that, with limited visiting hours, you know, two hours a day or once a week or whatever, um, to being the last chosen for a team, um, kids making fun of you, um, et cetera. Beating you up. Beating you up, although <laughs> a polio survivor I know who's also a physician <coughs> said, a good friend A good friend is someone who will beat up the kid who made fun of you. A really good friend brings that person to you and lets you beat them up. <laughs> Dr. Uelberg, I was clinically diagnosed with post polio sequela and syndrome with Judith K. Silver at the uh, International Rehabilitation Center for Polio for the part of Spalding Rehab in the Boston area uh -huh. back in 2001. And um, it wasn't until probably, I go there about every other year still, so I've been being treated there for this amount of time and I'll be there in the spring and then here. Uh, it wasn't until probably five years ago that <clears throat> I asked to uh, have an appointment with, they have a psychologist who would come in, Dr. Stephanie Mitchell, who I've seen some articles in the Oh, yeah. Anyway, so she was, uh, the, the three or four appointments that I had with her uh, have been so insightful because she helped me understand. My first question was, I was 14 months old when I was stricken with paralytic polio from the waist down. And I don't have any conscious, conscious, memory. conscious memory of that. And what she helped me understand is that first of all, and, and her specialty is PTSD. Okay. She helped me understand that what we've survived, what we've endured as uh, surviving a uh, uh, disease like we have, is that we have uh, dealt with similar symptoms and things in our life, uh, most undoubtedly similar to PTSD. And my question to her was, gee, I was only 15 months old, 
I really don't have any conscious recollection. How does that impact me? And she said that it's embedded there uh, subconsciously, that it has affected me, it has shaped me. But this was, um, I'm going to be 65, so probably not until I was 60 did I benefit from meeting with a psychologist to help me understand more of what I went through emotionally and psychologically, even though I didn't consciously remember the initial acute paralytic component of my life. And so if you were having trouble hearing, basically, um, he asked to see the psychologist at the polio, uh, post polio clinic that he goes to in Boston and um, found that really helpful. And, and the parallel between the experience of having had polio and hospitalizations, et cetera, to PTSD in people that have been through war or raped or whatever. Yeah, I think, you know, again, I think we all have some psychological scars as well as the physical scars. I'm the one person here who did not have a polio. Um, one of the things that would be very helpful is to help your spouse understand. Because we've been married 53 years, I guess, and I'm just now understanding where he's coming from. Yeah, giving it. <laughs> <laughs> right. So the point she was making is the importance for spouse or family members to know. And you know, sometimes you are consciously aware of that and you can express that, and sometimes you it's unconscious if you're not. Like, you know, a tremendous need to excel probably may be related to the polio and excel at all costs. Um, and you may not be, you just think that's the way life is and life should be lived and uh, you may not consciously put the two together. Something someone said to me once was, that I found really useful was, if you were going to describe yourself, list 10 things about yourself. And then look at the list, are they all nouns or are they adverbs? And if they're nouns, then if you lose the ability to do those things, a whole lot of your self-worth goes down with you. One of the things that, at the age of 14, I was in the hospital almost four months. And when I got out, it was like, okay, go home. And I was still in wheelchair crutches, and they'd already told my parents I would never walk. And it was like, I'm, we never spoke about it. My parents were excellent. I mean, I've heard a lot of horror stories. But one of the things I remember when we first started our group, that was the first time we'd gotten together and actually talked about our polio problems. It was like, eh, you know, don't, don't mention this, you know, whatever. You got a lamp, okay. And I think one of the things, write your story down. You don't have to show it to anybody unless you want to. But get it out, and I know it, it helps. And we're kind of trying to do this in our newsletter now. And Joanne, most of us back here can't hear you at all. Really? I'll, I'll, I'll summarize. Oh, I wish we had had a... So Joanne was saying that, uh, you know, <coughs> She was discharged from the hospital and in our health preparation and, and her family, despite being a good family, did not really talk about it much. Or any, and it's one of the things she's found useful with the support groups is people talking about their experience. And her recommendation is that you write down about it, even if you don't show it to anybody else, just to get the words out on paper. And that's not terribly uncommon. Sometimes um, the polio epidemics and people being in quarantine, families were very embarrassed about that. Um, and it was better not to tell sort of everybody and, and not then their kids not be allowed to play with you, etc. Um, and for a whole number of reasons, um, parents 
Can you feel totally responsible for what happens to your kids, even if before the vaccine there was nothing they could do about it? Uh, so there may be some guilt there. Um, my sister and I both had polio, and we rarely talked about the impact that it's had on our lives. Don't be offended or surprised if the healthcare provider questions your diagnosis of polio. Either directly or indirectly. And, for, and one is, it's their job to scientifically evaluate the facts. One of the physicians I saw here in Tucson when I was in medical school uh, was an internist who had was just a year or two out of residency. And I mean, this was back in the 70s, but so he had some knowledge of polio. But he asked me some questions, and then he did a complete neurologic exam, checking my muscle strength, but also whether I had sensation, whether I had a Babinski, whether when they stroke the bottom of your foot, your toe goes up. And he did that all just, to, and he got done, and he said, yeah, what they taught us in medical school was correct. <laughs> but it was a way that really reinforced that in his head, and I really appreciated that. No, Babinski means it's a spinal cord, a, a higher level problem, usually a brain problem. Because I have that too. Okay. Right, yep. Could be from a back injury or a stroke or whatever. Yeah. Rarely today are the records available for the healthcare provider to get. In Denver, if people were at Children's Hospital until about a year ago, they could most 90% or so of the time to get the old records, but then Children's decided that it just took up too much storage space, etc. And they put a notice in the paper, and if you didn't respond in a couple months, they destroyed them all, so none of those records are available anymore. Um, some of you may believe that the diagnosis of your polio was made from a spinal tap, and you may indeed have had the spinal tap, but the spinal tap just ruled out bacterial meningitis. It did not, back particularly in the 50s, they did not have the way that they could do the, the virus studies and prove that it was polio. Plus, the polio virus only lives in the spinal fluid for a couple days, and after that, it's, it's in your stool and other places, but it's not. So, um, the spinal tap did not confirm, having had a spinal tap did not confirm that you had, that you had polio. Um, I think you, go ahead. Is there a genetic um, gene that polio virus attacks? Yes. Well, cooperates with, and that's how you get it. Well, that's how you, yeah. So, I haven't seen the final results of this study, but a few years ago at one of the International Post Polio Conferences, there was a researcher there from Canada that was recruiting people in a study because he had pretty good evidence that there's a gene in people who are paralyzed there's a gene that allowed the virus to get into the nerve cells. Um, only about 1% of people that are exposed to the polio virus and, and even get enough dose that they develop immunity, develop paralysis. About 99% of people just have a flu-like illness, develop the immunity, and go on. So, you know, that's why, and that can help explain why Sometimes in a family, you all were eating and drinking pretty much the same things, but only one person got the polio. Well, that's the way I Well, only one. Right. But I haven't seen the result, final results of his study, but it was an interesting thing. Not that it changes anything for any of us, but it uh, helps explain it. Um, I think you probably all know or have heard that post polio syndrome is a diagnosis of exclusion, which means there's no test or series of tests that prove 
that you have post polio syndrome. The EMG can prove that you had polio at some time, but it's not going to look any different if somebody who had polio got the recovery and then went on that way and is going on that way for the rest of their life from those who are going to develop post polio syndrome. And even some neurologists don't, don't know that. Um, what the purpose of the tests are is to, that may be done is to prove that you don't have a spinal cord or tumor or multiple sclerosis or something else for which the treatment would be totally different. Medical, also, medical technology has given us new information and new insights. Last summer, I saw a gentleman who's now in his early 70s, who he and his family had been believed, had been told to believe, that he had polio at age six or seven months. Um, one of the things that made me start saying, hmm, was, he said he was blind for three months, the first three months after the onset. And that doesn't fit. Then, when I did the exam, I mean, the sun was obvious looking at him, but all of his weakness was on the right side. His right arm was up like this. He had a stroke. And he you know, certainly has some significant needs. But um, we didn't think back then that kids had strokes. And we didn't have CT scans and MRIs to prove it. And, you know, it would be nice to know now, to get a CT or an MRI now. But I just, it isn't going to change things for him. And I just told him, if you fall and hit your head and go to the emergency room and they do a CT scan of your head, don't be surprised if they say, when did you have that stroke? I have a question about um, like a polio thyroid test. Could a person take a polio thyroid test to determine if they had polio or if they had a vaccination? Is there a way to separate the genetic vaccination no. versus antibodies? There's not a, so the question is, will the titer of the antibodies, the immunity you have, uh, could that be done? Yes, it can be done. Um, it probably needs to be sent to a special lab. It can be done. But does that help determine whether you had polio or whether you had the immunization? No. And that's the reason it's not very helpful. It'd be helpful if um, perhaps you were raised Christian scientist and never got any medical care and then continued on as a Christian scientist and did not, did not believe in um, traditional uh, Western medicine and so never received any, either the shots or the oral polio vaccine. But if you have a high titer, it just, it can't, it can't differentiate. Well, I had a polio titer test and I've never been vaccinated, even though I would question that as a child. But the doctors would always, always tell me that I was immune. But then of course at that time I didn't know there were three types. Three types, right? And I didn't know about the polio virus. But my title test showed antibodies for all three polio types with one higher than the others. So does that mean that I have three different types of polio? Because I have deformities starting at my toes going crisscrossing my body and going all the way up. So she had the title done and it showed that she had antibodies to all three types, one being higher than the other. And what does that mean? Um, before the vaccine, probably most kids were exposed to the virus. And you, you, know, you may have, from some of the other types, had a flu-like illness, and somebody else said, oh, you just have a stomach flu. Um, there is, among the three types, there is, all three can cause paralysis, but some of them, type one is more light, is generally more virulent, more likely to cause paralysis. So, um, don't know. But, you know, I, for me, I had the disease. I don't know whether that's type one, two, or three. Then I got the shots as soon as they came out, and then I got the sugar cubes. So, 
Who knows? But I haven't had the tightness checked. So, really tough. Poliovirus type 1, poliovirus type 2, poliovirus type 3. <laughs> and they're close cousins. Um, they can all cause paralysis. Um, some of them are more, life, are more virulent, meaning that people are more likely to have a severe case than others, but um, it doesn't, just because somebody has paralysis, looking at you, I can't say, oh, you can type 3. Um, they, they use that information now um, when they're looking at the, at the polio cases in the world, and they can now <coughs> tell. Um, so I get, because I'm our Rotary International District Polio Chair, um, I did a weekly report of the cases in the world and whether they were type 1, type 2, type 3. Sometimes people are mixed, and particularly some of the circulating vaccine derived are type 2 and type 3. Type 2 in the wild has not been seen since the late 1990s, and it's not in any of the oral polio vaccine given around in other countries of the world anymore. Um, although there still are a few cases of circulating vaccine derived, and you can get into that later, but of type 2, but type 2 has been eliminated. Type 3 is pretty much eliminated in the wild form. Um, I think the last case was like maybe in 2010. Um, so we'll be moving towards the, the vaccine in the United States is back to using the shots because a certain number of people did get polio from the oral polio vaccine. Um, and it's still trivalent, it's still all three types. Um, these ladies can stand for me. Perfect. And I have a question. Um, what are the symptoms of the three different types? The symptoms are all similar. There's not going to be anything that tells the difference, but for most people, it's a flu like illness, maybe a, a, a fever. Um, it's an enterovirus, so maybe some vomiting, diarrhea. Um, aching all over, and uh, then um, if you're one of the 1% um, developing some paralysis somewhere, and it can be anywhere. It can be the nerves to any voluntary muscle, so it can be to a muscle in your face, to your arm, to your leg, to some combination. Well, Linda was raising for me. Which one of the three are, are or all three considered ball bar. What's that term? Okay, sure. Um, ball bar just means that it affected areas in the base of your brain that control the muscles to swallowing or breathing. So sometimes people talk, they talk about three types, and three types of poliovirus one, two, or three, or ball bar, spinal, ball bulb, spinal, or ball bar paralytic. And it's just what part of the body is affected. But it can be any of the three viruses that did that. So following question, would that tie into the web-based dissertations you see on the reticular activating brain stem, which is breathing heartbeat? The rats? Um, potentially, yeah. It's more likely in uh, sort of ball wire involved. But uh, yeah. Thank you. Did they have all three types then? Yep. Yep, and we just didn't have the way. I mean, they knew, and that's why Salk and Sabin made a trivalent vaccine, which trivalent means all three viruses. Um, but it was, the technology for determining wasn't really available to the ordinary doc in the community. Plus, it didn't matter. Yeah. I'm hearing that they're using snake venom in polio. I've heard little rumblings about that, but um, the question was using snake venom and polio virus. 
us. And I think more there are some folks that have got some components of sleep than can help with paralysis. Um, but not necessarily in the vaccine to make it like better or whatever. You. Okay. Well, I just want to clarify again. So there's there are three types of polio virus. Uh -huh. And then there was a wild virus, or it's a wild virus part of one. No, the, the three before vaccine, all of it was a wild virus. Right. Okay. There now is what we call a circulating vaccine derived polio which actually is a result of using the oral vaccine. Because that was made with a live That's made with a live attenuated virus. Supposedly inactivated, but sometimes that mutates and becomes uh, the other. And there's pros and cons. Um, the reason we don't use the oral vaccine in the United States anymore is we've learned that four to ten people a year developed polio as a result of getting the oral polio vaccine. And when the big epidemics were gone, it was decided that wasn't an acceptable risk. You know, when before, if before you had 50,000 cases a year, then four to ten people getting polio from the vaccine was judged to be an acceptable risk because you saved 49, whatever, 49,906. 90, yeah. Um, when, so we went back to using, kids now all get the shots, the inactivated, the killed, the SALC vaccine. Um, I'll get you. <laughs> the oral vaccine um, is still used in developing countries because one, it's a whole lot easier to um, distribute. Secondly, it actually confers some gut immunity to the polio. So if those folks get exposed to polio, not only are they um, not going to get it, or, uh, but they aren't going to keep excreting live virus in their stool and back into the sewage system and the water system. So, um, and the other is, that nobody really talks about is in countries where you've got a really poor sanitation system. If you immunize half the kids in the village, you immunize 75 to 90 percent of the kids in the village because they got it from contaminating. They get the polio virus vaccine from contaminated water or food. Um, the other is with the oral vaccine, particularly in places where people are very resistant to the vaccination. It's much easier to convince a mother to let you give her kid a couple drops of medicine than to convince a mother to get, who's largely uneducated to give her kid a shot. Um, so there are, last year in the world, there were 109 cases of circulating vaccine-derived polio. Um, a good number of those in Papua New Guinea, which have not seen polio, but it means that you've got a good population of unimmunized people that are susceptible to this. Um, the good news is that with the circulating vaccine derived, if the World Health Organization, whatever, jumps on it very quickly, you can stop that. So in 2017, there were like 58 cases of circulating vaccine-derived polio in Syria. In 2018, there were none. And so far this year, there's none in Papua New Guinea either. I've got vaccine-derived polio from the city in Germany. Does that mean you can potentially have two polios or three polios? No, if you got it from the vaccine, from the same vaccine, then you you got all in that vaccine you got all three types. So you're not going to get it again. No, I mean when I got sick of the polio, did I have all three? I don't know. The only way the only way to know is to test a stool sample in the first two to three months and have them do the specific genetic testing on that. I'm fine.
mine, and actually, I mean, I didn't know exactly how much time I had, so you're here till 12. You're here till 12, and I figured um, I would just go, and I could then just answer general questions at the end, but I'm, I'm fine. Would you like to sit down? No, I'm, I'm good. At, this isn't the most stable, but it's okay. It's better than that table. <laughs> To get back, maybe more focused on what can we do to work with our positions. Sure. I have no need to explain to my position. There are three types no, no. of virus, and this is what's viral. Sure. You know, I think that those are academically interesting. They're personally interesting to my own history. But what I'm sure. trying to say is we don't really know which of the three or two or all three that any of us got. Right. And that any one of them or all three or two of them could cause the particular symptoms we have because they can all affect various parts of the nervous system. Right. Is that a fair That's a fair thing. The one thing I would add to that is sometimes polio survivors think that they don't need because they have polio they don't need to get the vaccine. And um, I've had people call me and be in a big panic because they were going on a safari to Africa and a pol polio booster was required. And I'm like, oh my goodness, can I do that? Yes, because we don't know what type you had. And if you get exposed to one of the other two types, you could potentially get polio again. Okay, that's good. <clears throat> I'm just going to stand up. It's easier for people to hear you at 360. Um, Last year, I had a hip replacement, uh -huh. and the notable part about it was, and I was going to follow up later with bracing and a conversation, I could not find the type of rehab suit I needed to rehab after the event. But during the event, when I did the accounting most recently, I found a $5,000 charge for a special physician that was flown in just to do the anesthesia. And the reason it was because I really connected with the surgeon and I said to him, I'm really world worried about general anesthesia. Several people have said, be careful. So he brought somebody in from UCLA that did the job. And it was really expensive and I didn't even really get billed the amount that was in there. But for those of you who end up not bracing and have for sure know you have respiratory related matters at an age point like mine, which is 70, it's well worth pursuing looking for a surgeon if you do decide to go to bone transplant level who knows these types of people and will bring them in because if you don't, the downside is if you're bulber like I am, you might actually expire. If you do talk it over with a surgeon, you'll find a guy like in Tucson, Dr. Michael Miller and his friends who are really skilled surgeons and they'll bring in the right people, and they know about polio. He's one of the rare guys. I looked all over the country for a surgeon who's right here. Yeah. Very good. Okay, there we go. Yeah, and it is, particularly for people with bulbar polio, it is really important to do, um, have somebody who, yeah, for anesthesia that understands about that, and possibly even um, if you've got some respiratory issues, a pulmonologist who understands about that to be able to be taken care of you. Um, and um, you'll have to buck, unless you have a really supportive doctor, you're going to have to buck the system a bit because the tradition is that you don't know who the anesthesiologist is until the night before or the day of. Yep. And you may have to say, no, I want a face to face meeting with the anesthesiologist. I had a long talk with Dr. Selma Combs, I'm sure you've met her, and her job, her working job was the Chief of Anesthesiology at UCLA Medical School. Mm -hmm. And she said that we should not be afraid, unless we have vulgar involvement, of anesthesia anymore because most of the problems were caused by the older drugs. Right. And she has relieved a big burden off my mind because I don't right. have bulbar issues. Right. So I'm not afraid of getting surgeries done anymore as long as I let the anesthesiologist know that I have sleep apnea or post polio. And those are the questions you're going to get asked anyway. But I've really had much better luck now not insisting on telling right. the doctor what type of anesthesia I need. Right, and I think that's a good point that for most people, um, unless you have all of our 
issues, yes. breathing and or swallowing issues. Um, the newer anesthetic agents are not a major issue and uh, you don't necessarily have to request a certain person or whatever. And it's still useful to let them know, but um, it's, not, it's not the big issue it was when we were using curare, et cetera. Yep. Yes. Yes. Because you were you were well you were in the iron one because you had breathing problems. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, that's what we'll work it over. <laughs> okay. one, of the, one of the things I did early on, which I don't know if everybody does, but I keep a sheet of paper in my wall of all my medication, of, of what I can do and can't do physically and and uh, one of it uh, is mind altering medications and, and all stuff like that so if I were in a car accident or when I go they want this stuff I don't have to read it off I can just hand them the paper right. and photocopy it. Right. That, having a list is really helpful when as we get more mature. I carry it for years. Our, our memories aren't necessarily as good but, but there are going to be times that you know and, and the anesthesia issue there's going to be times that you have an appendix that is about to burst and you don't have time to get a special anesthesiologist or whatever. Um, let's go here. So what is the quickest way to ascertain whether or not you had Volbar? Just if you if you had had then or now have breathing or swallowing problems that somebody said this might be related to your Volbar. Or through your medical records from 19 yeah, if you, you can get them, yep, if you can get them, that's great. Okay. But I found that generally, and people may have had mild vulvar polio, but generally, if I ask, were you ever in an iron lung, and if so, for how long? You know, a day, I'm not sure that counts, but, you know, if you're in an iron lung for a week, for three months, or whatever, then I'm pretty sure you're in vulvar polio. Here. I've got a question that I can't seem to find any information about, and I think there are probably other people in this room. Uh, I've had multiple traumatic brain injuries that was nearly killed in the clinic I manage. If anybody's had a serious automobile accident, you've had a traumatic brain injury. If you've fallen and hit your head, you've had a traumatic brain injury. And most likely, the only thing that a physician will ask is, on a history, do you have epilepsy? Well, no, but I've had multiple traumatic brain injuries, but as it relates to post-polio, because there can be neurological uh, and even cognitive issues because of the brain infections we might have had, these are confounding. Can you talk about, in post-polio itself, what potential cognitive things we should be aware of? You've mentioned, as we get older, memory, blah, 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 but some of this is older, eight, not normative aging, but some of it is not. Correct. Um, generally, and there's, there's some controversy in the medical community that takes care of polio survivors about brain injury, per se, um, brain damage from polio. Um, certainly, Richard Bruno in his book, The Polio Paradox, has some interesting theories, and unfortunately, we've not had the technology to really prove what, what Bodine saw in autopsies back in the 50s and 60s is present now, and most polio survivors aren't willing to submit to a brain biopsy <laughs> to find out. <laughs> um, but um, generally, some brain fog, some fatigue, particularly just not being as sharp, particularly if you're really tired or you've gone several hours without eating, I'll say, yeah, that could be or maybe related to your polio. Um, if it's, you know, clearly dementia, which some of us in this room will get, um, that's not related to polio. If you get so you don't know your wife's name, your children's name, don't recognize them, that's not related to polio. And that, but that does bring me to one of the other points.
points is when you're seeing a physician or whatever, most likely you're not a pure case of your polio anymore. You know, that might have been true when you were 15, when you were four, depending on when you had polio, et cetera. But we've all had some illnesses, some injuries, aging, um, you know, whatever. So it's actually one of the time, I used to feel really intimidated when I'd go to the post-polio conferences because there were these neurologists and orthopedic surgeons who were talking and quoting the latest literature, et cetera. And I'm saying, you know, I'm just a family doc and I'm sort of a jack of all trades, master of none. But as the polio population is aging, it's really useful to, for me to have some knowledge about diabetes and hypertension and heart disease and even some of the cancers, whatever. Um, because there's usually an inner point. And, you know, people want to know, well, how much is my polio and how much is something else? And there's not a good way to say about that, really, but you've been really patient back there. I've been wondering, I read about uh, you going to San Diego to, to a doctor, and you got a brace that enabled you to walk a lot better than you could before. Right. Uh, I'm having the same issues you were. Okay, Let, let's, let's talk about that later. Okay, but I'd like to put this out as a cautionary, and I think you'll agree, I hope, is that I was so caught up in post-polio being my only problem, and I started having problems, and I just chopped them off as getting older with polio. And they were simple problems, like not being able to concentrate, a loss of vision, even a weird thing like having carpal tunnel and back aches. Oops. I almost lost my life because it was a brain tumor. And so I had to learn the hard way that I had to look at my other problems just like any other person right. and not go in assuming that post polio was the only problem I had. Right. And like, you know, some of the things like loss of vision are not related to polio. And I wrote an article, um, no, now, six, seven years ago that was in post polio health. Um, about what polio causes, doesn't cause, and might cause. Because physicians also, I've had patients whose eye doctor has told them that, yeah, your cataracts could be related to your polio. No. <laughs> no. So, um, is that, yes? Me? Mm -hmm. What are some of the main symptoms of post polio syndrome? Okay. So, post polio. The definition of post polio syndrome. And there's lots of language, you know, late effects. In, in Australia, it's late effects of polio. Um, and then sequelae of polio. To me, sequelae of polio means what you were left with. Like, I already, ever since I had polio, I've had a weak left leg. Um, if that's getting weaker, then that puts it over in the category of post polio. So the main, so the criteria are that you need to have had a confirmed, well as best we can tell, a diagnosis of polio, because obviously you can't have post polio if you never have polio. Um, and you know that's harder now if there aren't records or whatever. But so if if it's one if it's one leg that's atrophied and sort of the right story, there's not many other things that will do that. Um, it could be from exam, from history, just yes, you tell me a story that sounds you know, very much like that. EMG that can prove that you did indeed have polio. There's a very characteristic pattern seen on EMG. Uh, that doesn't mean everybody needs to have an EMG, but it is there. And then, the sim then a period of stability of at least 15 years uh, can be longer. And then one of the following three, or all, some combination of them, possibly all three, of uh, increasing weakness, decreasing function, and that can be in muscles that were, that we knew were affected, and sometimes in muscles that we thought weren't affected, because they were pretty mild. If, you know, if your left leg didn't work at all, and you had a little weakness in your right hand, nobody might have noticed that. 
And now we may be getting more weakness in the right hand. Um, musculoskeletal pain, and people who are old enough to have polio describe that as feeling like they're getting polio all over again. Um, and again, you can lump things into there. To me, somebody who wears out their good knee or their good hip, um, to me, that's part of post polio syndrome. Or they worn out their shoulders from using crutches or a manual wheelchair for years. To me, that's part of post polio syndrome. But some of the purists would not say it was. And then, for some people, unexplained fatigue. You know, there's a, by 2 o'clock in the afternoon, you hit the polio wall and you just can't put one foot in front of the other. Um, in terms of you not being a pure case of your polio, the other thing that you and your um, healthcare providers need to know is that the effects of polio may impact other aspects of your health. And sometimes the physicians will not be really attuned to this. Um, for example, what kind of exercise can you do? I've had polio survivors with a weak leg who then had a heart attack, and all their cardiologists can say every visit is, are you walking three miles a day? <laughs> but they can do exercise that promotes heart health, like using a rowing machine or swimming or doing some other things. Um, also, if you have osteoporosis of your legs, but you've got a lot of weakness in your legs, you know, the doctor's going to say, well, do some weight-bearing exercise. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, the ease or your ability to get to and from the bathroom will probably affect whether you want to take diuretics or not. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, you know, if it's a real effort to get in there, get on the toilet, um, you're not going to want to take that Lasix 40 milligrams twice a day. Um, if you have limited hand strength, the, the ability to put on your, the CPAP or Kleenex or put on the, it may affect the way, the kind of straps that are on your brace. Um, or your ability to use insulin syringes or hearing aids. You know, the hearing aids now are so tiny. So, and those are things that your healthcare provider may not consider. They'll just say, oh yeah, you know, your diabetes is getting to this point, you need to start insulin now. But it's really hard. There now are some, some pens and whatever, but it's really hard to draw up insulin and give yourself a, a shot if you only have one good hand. <laughs> those of you who have hand weakness understand that better than I do. I, I sometimes think that I'm fairly aware, and then some patient will tell me something that's like, oh, um, I had a patient who had a lot of weakness in the right hand, and was so glad to get one of the newer cars that's just a, you know, you have the key fob and just a button, because you have to insert the key on the right. If you, you know, to do that with your left hand is a real challenge. And the woman who started our post polio group in Colorado had absolutely no use of her arms and was ventilated, or partially ventilated with them. She could breathe if she was sitting straight up. Um, she wrote an article once about the difficulty and the, the funny looks they got when her husband went in the back bathroom with her when they were out. Because, you know, do you go to the men's bathroom or the women's bathroom? Because she needed him to pull her pants up and down. We know about that. <laughs> 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 Not in bathrooms. Right. <laughs> I was had to take the door down. Right. Mickey knows about that. <laughs> Can you explain to us, I'm not sure how this works in the medical field, now when you go to the hospital, your private doctor may send you to the hospital, 
but she doesn't come right. to the hospital. They have hospitalists? Hospitalists, yeah. And so do I need to consider anything about my post polio, or are they going to get those in the records? Depends. Uh-oh, that's not good. Right. So it probably is useful to have, like we talked about some of those things written out, and be able to take with you all. Um, if now there are all these hospital systems, and a lot of physicians are employed by hospitals now. Um, if that's true, if your physician is part of that hospital system, then they probably share the same elect same computer system. And then they can get the information. They're working on interoperability between computer systems. But like in Denver, when I was at St. Anthony's, if there was a hospital that was about two miles away and North Suburban, um, if people were there, and they were a totally different system, if people had gone there for care, we had to do the old request the records and wait a month. <laughs> so, yes, but these days expect that if you go to the hospital, the physician taking care of you will not be your physician. I was a geriatric care manager, and I want to go back and underscore and pat on the back when I'm over here. Sadly, even if you didn't have polio, even if you're kind of a, just an aging person, never assume that the records are there, never assume that they're correct, never assume anything. We've got to be self-advocates, and as we're getting older and the symptoms are increasing, it's harder and harder to do, and thank God for the spouses who hang in there with us. But, you know, make sure you always have the basic information somewhere easily accessible and take it with you. Right. You know, ideally, someplace, I was told by an Irish guy in Ireland, if you go to this system the first time to a dentist, from that moment on, all your records are available every place. We don't have that yet. No. We do. Well, we hope we live long enough to see it, but be your own advocate. And don't assume that the records will be there, or if they're there, that they're accurate. Right. And I'll, and I'll second that. is update your records all the time. Regular. Yeah. And I think, um, yeah, absolutely, and um, one of the disadvantages of an electronic medical record is it's really easy to cut and paste, and so incorrect information will go on forever because somebody just highlights it, cuts and pastes it, um, and not doing this stuff again, so. Yes, sir, in the back. Um, yes, I'm speaking for him. Okay. Um, so, uh, let's, let's talk about that afterwards, I'll be around, but it's, there, there are some options and, um, but that doesn't really apply to the majority of people here or what's going on, so I'll get you and you later. Okay, another question. Another question, alright. How safe are these electronic stuff, we're starting that in Prescott, and I have refused it because twice now I have been called. When you had surgery in New Mexico, and I said I have never had anything done in New Mexico, I refused to pay. But this was not me. I blame that on electronics and whatever, and I have refused it. Um, it may not all be. So the question was getting calls and particularly billing about things that have happened, supposedly happened, you've had done and not been done. It's not just electronics. That may be part of it, but it's it's a, it can be a scam. And part in Colorado now, anytime you go for healthcare, you have to show a photo ID. Because people that were uninsured were just like people use other people's social security number, they were getting insurance numbers and then having their back surgery as Larry Smith. Um, and only got caught if Larry Smith said, no, 
I didn't know I had that surgery. Do you consider electronic uh, medical records safe? What should we use them? Um, I think, you know, there's pros and cons. But, you know, certainly we lost charts when they were paper charts or misplaced them. So, um, you know, there's nothing that's really safe. And, you know, the whole HIPAA thing drives me crazy because the reality is, other than if you're some celebrity, it probably protects the paparazzis from getting the information that you were in the hospital and what you had done. But the insurance company has, still has a right to see that. All of the accrediting agencies have the right to see that. You know, it's really, there really is sort of no such thing as true privacy in your records. If you could separate the ravages of aging from post polio syndrome, would your therapeutic recommendations be significantly different? Um, generally not. Um, and so then I don't worry about it a lot, but with the times I do worry about it is, you know, we have uh, one of my friends um, in high school who had had polio. Um, went to a physician saying, you know, I'm, I'm getting tired or, you know, particularly having a lot of problems with fatigue. And, and this were, was a polio clinic. And they said, oh, you're overweight, just lose some weight and you'll feel better. She came back a month later and said, they said, well, you lost 20 pounds in a month. Isn't that wonderful? Do you feel better? She said, no. Long story short, she had diabetes, uncontrolled diabetes. I mean, the treatment for that is totally different. Yes. So, like, if somebody tells me they're having fatigue, I want to know, you know, what, how's your thyroid working and what's your blood sugar? Because the treatment for that's going to be way different. And I don't want to be, you know, say, oh, just, you know, pace your activities and rest. So it depends. But some of the stuff from aging will be different. Um, but some of the specific diagnosis that, for which there's a specific treatment, then that is important. And that's what I tend to rule out because there's no way. The definition is that you've excluded all other possibilities. Well, that would cost millions of dollars. And, you know, that's just not practical. So. Um, Another thing, and this isn't really about talking to them, but just interacting with the physician's office, be aware that physicians, particularly, are not usually reimbursed for doing a whole lot of the paperwork. And they get tons of paperwork from the home health agency, from, if you're on Medicare, you're from your physical therapist, every month they have to sign off on the treatment plan. On a fact, um, from your orthotest, from your DME provider. Every time your wheelchair needs repairs, the physician has to sign a form that that's medically necessary before the company will even start repairing it. Do I know if your electric wheelchair needs repairs? No. And one is, if it really doesn't work, you're not going to be able to come in and see me. And I'm not coming out to your house and saying, well, yeah, it looks like the, you know, whatever, motherboard died. Um, it's, it's crazy. But if there are forms that you can get, like in Colorado, you can get the um, park, handicap parking form online and print it out. If you can do that before you go ask your physician to fill it out, and you filled in your name and address and all that sort of stuff as much as you can, that's really helpful, rather than me filling out James Smith, this date of birth, this address. <coughs> um, and thank them, or their office staff, for doing that. Um, sometimes you never see the forms. The forms from the, the DME, Durable Medical Equipment Company. And sometimes the questions on there are bizarre. 
If somebody needs a new mattress for their hospital bed, one of the questions I ask is how old is their present mattress? Yeah. That's not something I usually ask people. <laughs> yeah. Or if they need a lift now to move them from one place to another. I have to put down what the height and weight of their caregiver is. So I fill in what I can, and I learn to then um, send it. I send it to the person, saying, "You fill this in, and here's where you send it into." And one is that educates them of what stupid questions there are, um, but also they know the answers. I don't. Um, it's also not the provider's job to know all the ins and outs of your particular insurance. Um, you know, if we had a single payer, I could learn the rules of one company. I can't know the rules of 20 or 30 companies. Um, you know, all of the drugs they cover, which are tier one, which are tier two, which, which specialists are in the network, etc. Um, the insurance is a contract between you and your particular insurance, maybe with the employer somewhere in there. Um, and over time, physicians and their staff learn. Just because somebody's really unhappy, you sent, you sent me to the wrong specialist. Um, but they're not paid to know all the details, and they, and they can't. It was one of the things I was hoping when we went to an electronic medical record that it would mean when I went into the room, it was, okay, this person has um, this, in our, in our part of the country, secure horizons, and just on the exactly. screen it pop up, you can use these drugs, and you can, here's, if you want, you know, you just type in cardiologist and it'll tell you which cardiologist you can send them to. But that still hasn't happened, and keeping it up to date is a challenge. So. A question again. How did you respond when your kids whined about something? Whined, W-H-I-N-E-D. <laughs> right. So, it's sort of the same in with the healthcare provider. You know, that doesn't mean to not talk about what's going on. But if you're like, oh, what is this, this, and it's that, and my hair hurts, and my teeth itch, <laughs> it's not going to get you very, you know, the healthcare provider's sympathy is going to wear, wear thin real quick. Permanent employees. There was a while in our office that I made it a rule 
that I would not learn the names of the new person at the front desk until they'd been there two weeks. Because we had somebody come in at coffee break time, they left. Um, so it's, it is tough. In Colorado, the malpractice company requires that we, that the physician has initialed all results that come back, so they know that they've received it and it hasn't gotten lost unless you know the physician puts it to the side and it gets buried. But. This, this was one thing that I learned when we went through this in Green Valley is get a copy of everything you do. Get a copy when you have a blood test, when any kind of test. Right. Give them, get a copy for yourself. Well, or, or if you use the computer, you can go on. Make sure that it's no, make sure that downloaded it online. Copy so I can go back and I mean, they, they get things wrong. Okay. I'm just going to follow up on that too with the electronic records now and uh, online uh, capabilities. Um, I have, uh, you're able to set up your own account, for example, with uh, Sonar Quest where I get my blood work done. Uh, where I have my uh, uh, diagnostic tests done. And I can go online and I can get the copies of my reports within 24 hours usually, and I have it right there. And so that's, I'm not bothering the right. physician's office for it, right. but also I'm not sitting there wondering and worrying and so forth. Right. I can get that. So, uh, and, that, and, that's, and that's fine if you want to understand it or it comes back in the normal range. It well, I mean, like an INR. See my number. Sure. I'm not having to wait for the doctor to call me or expecting them. So. Sure. Okay, going to the doctors now. There are always a PA and an NA in the office, and you see the doctor one time and they say, well, now this time you're going to go see the NA. Tell me what is the difference between these two? What are they allowed to do for you? Okay. So, the, so the question is now with physician extenders, be that a PA, physician assistant, or a nurse practitioner, um, and what are their limits, abilities? Some of that depends on the licensure of the state. So in some states they're allowed to do different things than other states. Um, and. In Colorado, like nurse practitioners are allowed to practice independently and not necessarily have physician supervision, so they could, in the same year. Yeah. Um, but PAs have to, for like five years, have the first year some fairly significant physician supervision, and then it decreases over time. But their records have to be looked at at least once a week, etc. Both of them generally can write prescriptions. And one of the things that's very interesting is um, I provide me medical supervision for a clinic, a pediatric clinic run by pediatric nurse practitioners. They all have prescriptive authority. They can write prescriptions for like Adderall, amphetamines for kids with ADHD. They cannot write a prescription for OT, PT, or speech, or sign any of the progress notes. So they fax all of them to my house, and I sign them, having never seen this kid, um, although I'm getting to know some of them just by repeat records, um, and fax them back. And I know that's true for Medicare. It's Medicare and Medicaid. Um, that physician extenders cannot sign the orders for home health and for um, therapies, which is bizarre. I mean, kids can be hurt by, by amphetamines, but I don't think they're going to be hurt by OT, PT, or speech. But that's the difference. So I probably get 15 different faxes a week to, to sign. <coughs> There also are new rules about, it used to be for home health, that if you really are particularly limited, I could, and you call me and say, you know, I'm having some trouble breathing, and I might have pneumonia or whatever, I could, or I've 
developed a wound, it isn't healing, whatever. I could send home, home health out to do an assessment rather than having you come to the office and have them be sort of my eyes. Now for Medicare and Medicaid to pay for that, I have to have seen them within 30 days before that visit. Hmm. So I can't, can't do that anymore. Um, I'm going to have to say, come see me or go to the ER or whatever. A couple of quick things, and I know I appreciate your patience, and I know a few of you have gotten up to use the facilities, and that's certainly fine. Um, understand healthcare providers and their staff are people too, and they may have just had a horrendous fight with their teenage son just before coming into the office and may not be in a very good mood. Um, there were certainly times that I had a bad cold or something, and sometimes listening to people, it was like, I feel worse than you do. <laughs> Why are you wasting my time? Um, or, you know, they may be caring for a parent that's in hospice care or whatever. Um, so, give people a little leeway. That doesn't mean if they're a total jerk, you need to continue seeing them. I recently have been watching Doc Martin on PBS. Oh, yeah. And uh, he's certainly a crusty old guy. But <laughs> if you watch long enough, he sort of does the right things for the people. Um, Pretty much always. And the other thing to know, and part of the reason that there are less physicians that are starting their own practice these days are, is the average physician beginning practice, right out of residency or fellowship, has $189,000 in student loan debt. That, they have to start making the first payment, which is probably going to be two, three thousand dollars a month within 30 days of finishing their training. So they cannot afford to open a practice. They need to be employed by somebody. <clears throat> Fortunately, when I went to the University of Arizona Med School, our tuition was 750 bucks a year. Oh. And vocational rehabilitation paid for it. Oh. <laughs> but, and I felt pretty guilty about that, but I have paid that money back in increased income taxes a whole lot of times. <laughs> it was one of the better investments our government made. Um, and just also, the standard appointment is usually about 15 minutes. Um, some orthopedists schedule patients every six minutes, or some will do a wave system of three every 15 minutes. Um, and geriatricians, geriatric doctors usually have longer appointments. But it really is useful to sort of know, know in advance. Sometimes you can say, I've got a lot of things to talk about. Can I make it? Is there a way you can make it a longer appointment? Um, but, and I think that pretty well concludes, plus Nikki's over here. Well, I just don't want to abuse you. Well, that's Since fine. Time is valuable. Sure. And I will talk to the two people who had questions that were sort of specific. Well, and I was assuming that while I was closing up things, you would go back there and answer a few questions. Just promise me that you'll be good to her. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.